It's time to get the breakdown started. One, two, three, three. First up, 10 observations. Just took it out and just boom, put it right on the ground. It's first and 10. We start with the place that we have to start. We start with Patrick Mahomes because this is ultimately about him. The fact that he is inevitable. The fact that he just is that guy in a way that we have only had a select few that guys in the history of this game. Patrick Mahomes is 28 years old, and if he retired today, he'd be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I'll get to more stats on Mahomes and the legacy in just a moment. But the official number one is just merely the brilliance of that final drive. Um, it starts off kind of dicey. Uh, they they have Pacheco up the middle. He finds Rasheed Rice for a gain of six. They run Pacheco up the middle again, and now it's fourth and one. They come out of that timeout, and they get a monster, monster conversion on fourth and one. Super Bowl could have ended right there. All right, that's that's great. Mahomes finds Valdez Scantling for what should be, uh, or it doesn't, it doesn't end. So great for Kansas City, bad for San Francisco. Uh, finds Valdez Scantling out in the right, the right side. Should have been a gain of six. Instead, he gets his footing as he's being knocked down. Winds up being controlled of himself again. Gets tackled three yards behind the line of scrimmage, and now you're looking at second and thirteen. They get uh, seven of it right back, and then on third and six, Mahomes gets another conversion. Uh, they trickle the ball down the field again, so much so that Kyle Shanahan calls a timeout on defense to tell Steve Wilkes, stop playing this soft doo-doo coverage, get out of it. By the way, at this point, Mahomes, zero incompletions. Spoiler alert, he wouldn't have one on the drive. Finds Pacheco, scrambles up the middle again for 13. Pacheco on another short gainer. Mahomes to Kelsey on that middle screen, and then he finds Miko Hartman on Corndog for the touchdown. So on the final drive, that is a scramble for a first down conversion, a completion for a first down conversion on third down, and a fourth and six conversion where he, or sorry, a fourth and one conversion where he's the runner. That was Patrick Mahomes in the biggest moment of his career. And that is Patrick Mahomes in every other big moment of his career. The inevitability of him is stunning. And to execute this consistently on this stage is Brady-esque, Jordan-esque, and I don't know how many others fit that bill. Um, despite his reputation, LeBron is pretty damn close to having that where it just seems like, especially recently, um, in this back half of his career, once he broke the seal on his championships, he's always up for the moment. Now he's lost some championship games, but I mean, he's lost some championship series where he's been the best player on the floor. He does not come up short. He has been a part of the team that is not the Golden State Warriors. But Steph has gotten to this level where in the biggest playoff moments, he has also been able to to figure out how to be that guy. Um, there, there's just an inevitability to Mahomes in the absolute biggest moment where he's calm. He gives that little like, hey, give me the play. All right, I, I in completion or on other drives, not that one. Um, just come on, give me the play. Let's go. What's next? And that confidence is irreplaceable. It is it is truly remarkable and, and something that, you know, we talk about the analytics and we talk about, you know, feelings and, and emotion and uh, you know, at the end of the day, like psychology is extra extraordinarily powerful and there is extensive research on what confidence does for people, what belief does for people, what hope does for people. And if Mahomes is your quarterback, you have the ultimate confidence. You have the ultimate hope because and, and it's just going to cause everyone to execute better and seeing him execute that final drive to literal perfection is just truly remarkable it is what makes him him and there there is not enough praise in the like there's not a thing you could say about Patrick Mahomes that isn't true in terms of heaping praise and that includes that he's the greatest of all time now I don't th I guess the one thing you'd have to hold on and this is a matter of longevity because he is only 28 is that he has not had the career that Montana had that Brady had that some others but really if you look at it statistically it's pretty much those two have had in terms of longevity of success 
But in terms of peak of his powers, in terms of winning efficiency, he's the best to ever do it. And that includes Brady. And I realize that that efficiency is probably going to drop. Brady started as hot as Mahomes did and then ultimately has a 10-year gap between going on another run like what Patrick just did. So this is, again, I'm not saying that that Mahomes has already passed Brady. What I would tell you is that if I had to take either one to win a game, I'd take Mahomes, and I know how freaking good Brady is. Number two. When you talk about the legacy for Mahomes, uh, I already touched on some of this, but there's actually more, which is crazy. So Mahomes has made, in the six years that he has been a starting quarterback, he's made four Super Bowls. It's worth mentioning that he would have made a fifth if D. Ford hadn't lined up offsides. That's how close he was to being that much closer to perfect. Uh, in the Super Bowls, the only one that he has lost, he's now won three of the four that he has made, was to Tom Brady, and it happened in a game where Mahomes uh, didn't get a whole lot of help. He was fantastic uh, in that game, made a bunch of plays, had some iconic moments. Remember the one play where he throws a 50-yard ball in the air as he's falling, his knuckles pretty much scrape the ground, and in between multiple defenders, it hits Tyreek Hill into the face mask. That's Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Uh, Patrick Mahomes now is tied, or er, is no longer tied. He is in sole possession, third place all time in playoff wins. He has more playoff wins than Peyton Manning and everybody else, not named Joe Montana, who he is one away from. One. One away from Montana, and then Brady, who's in a whole class by himself. Again, the greatness times the longevity there is pretty much unmatched. Um, but there are 15, I, there's actually really 14, um, I believe, because I, I looked, I was looking at the stats yesterday, and there's like one quarterback who made the list, but it looked like he was a backup. He only had like one passing attempt, but he had uh, nine play, or 10 playoff wins. So 14 to 15, according to Stat Muse. Uh, quarterbacks who have 10 or more playoff wins. So if you have nine, you're tied for 15. Patrick Mahomes now has nine playoff wins when he's trailing by seven or more points at some point in the game. Do you realize how absurd that is? He was eight and two going into yesterday. He's now nine and two. 11 times Patrick Mahomes has been down by a touchdown or more in the playoffs. And he has won nine of those games and if you just counted them he would be top 20 all time in quarterback playoff wins that is stupid and that is his reality that is how good this dude is and again the consistency of greatness the consistency of winning in the playoffs and I think here's one thing that I will say again I'm not trying to diminish Brady Brady's the GOAT like, put the package together. Peak greatness is right there with Mahomes. I would take Mahomes, but Brady, like, it's a 1A, 1B situation. They do it very differently, but damn it, they got it done. And then the longevity of Brady is just unmatched in a way that, like, it's, it's a LeBron versus Jordan argument. Kind of LeBron is Brady, Jordan is Mahomes, if you will. Um, I think that's actually, maybe that's even a better comparison than I realized the more I think about it. We'll maybe revisit that later in the week. But... The point is, like, Brady, early in his career, kind of relied on the defense and actually wasn't that spectacular. Also, the game, the style of the game was different. It wasn't as quarterback-driven as it is now. Mahomes is the reason they are winning these games. Now, they this season is different for the Chiefs in a way that we'll talk about in terms of their defense in a moment. But it is, like, the, the, the significance, the weight of Mahomes' impact on these games, where he is the reason they win, the driving force of greatness, is just, I think it's pretty much unmatched in NFL history. And I was rooting for San Francisco. I wanted them to win. Um, but am I going to enjoy the greatness that is right in front of me? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Because what an idiot I would be as a fan of this game if I didn't. Number three. Travis Kelsey feels as inevitable as Mahomes in some ways. His first half last night was not very good. One catch, one bump of his coach, which I don't think was actually that big of a deal. I know it looked really bad, but I, I if I'm being honest, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, 
something that happens occasionally with competitors and Mahomes and or, uh, Reed and Kelsey have a ton of respect for each other. Anyway, point is, uh, one 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 bump of his coach, one target, one catch, one yard. And I eventually just, like at halftime and early in that third quarter as they started getting involved, I was like, I feel like they went in at halftime and went, all right, let's get back to what we do. This isn't working. Whatever our game plan was, just new game plan, fine 87. And damn, does he deliver. I mean, his highest recorded speed in years, literally, like six or seven years, was on that final play of regulation where he destroyed that San Francisco safety. He caught that crossing route, got upfield. I was like, oh my God, is he about to complete this fairy tale of his and score the game-winning touchdown as time expires. No, he gets tackled out of bounds, dislocating the shoulder. Uh, it felt like, uh, I don't know what actually wound up happening to Brown, the safety from the 49ers, but yikes, man. Uh, but big play after big play, has the big catch to set up the game-winning touchdown. I mean, that dude is, uh, again, and it's the consistency over time versus the peak greatness. If I had to pick one tight end for one game, I'd probably still pick Gronk. But you tell me I got a, a three seasons to fill, I'm picking Kelsey. Like, his consistency is remarkable, and his high level is remarkable, and his ability to focus. And apparently he gave a tremendous speech Saturday night. And the fun he has after singing Viva Las Vegas, like, what a delight. Um, I know a lot of people are not liking him right now for a variety of reasons. I'll choose to enjoy the greatness. I'll choose to enjoy him being fun, and I'll choose to enjoy the fact that he seems to have the right attitude about all of it um, from the competitiveness and, and how bad he wants it to how he can how he competes in the game to the way he's handled the fame his relationship having fun with it but in a way that's respectful like I know some people don't like it because whatever I I thoroughly enjoy the Travis Kelsey experience in all ways and um I'm very excited for his podcast this week, to say the least. Number four. Number four, though, is the guy that probably could have limited him. I don't know that we'll ever be able to properly put into the context the loss of Dre Greenlaw in this game. What a terrible, within the football context, tragedy that happened. Running onto the field, blow your Achilles. You're not only out for the Super Bowl, but probably a ton of next year. But Jesus, man, you're out for the Super Bowl in a freak accident where you're just running on the field and your cleat, whatever it is, gets caught in a bad way, the right amount of pressure, and goodbye to the Achilles. And he, not only is he a great player, but there is a heart and soul element to him, a physicality that he brings that was gone when he was gone. And in that second half especially, the Chiefs started to pick on his backup. So it was a play thing, but also the physicality and kind of the the maniacal way that Dre Greenlaw plays was there in that first quarter. And you're like, man, I don't know if Kansas City's got the answers to this. If they can get their offense going, it's going to be a Niners win. And all of a sudden, he's out. Would Kansas City have found a way to, to get some productivity? Of course, they're them. But hard to overstate how big of a loss Dre Greenlaw is within that game. And especially when it happens in the game, right? Because that means the his backup Burks didn't get a ton of reps in terms of practice and things like that. You don't prepare for like you do prepare, but you don't. It'd be different if you lost him in the AFC or the NFC Championship game, and Burks was was there and they had a plan. But now San Francisco's got to adjust, and if they could have just stuck with what they were doing, what they were doing was damn. Effective. Number five. Number five. All right, let's let's talk about it. Kyle Shanahan. Um, there's one decision that I didn't like from him in this game and one decision that I don't mind. And I will admit, I second guessed the one I don't mind last night on Twitter. You might've seen me say, why would you not take the ball first in or second in overtime? What is San Francisco doing? And I heard Kyle talk about it after the game and I've heard some analytics folks talk about it and I would still make the opposite decision, but it is basically 50, 50. Whether you take the ball first and then you have the chance to dictate terms and if the other team matches, you get the ball third, a.k.a. the first time that it's truly sudden death versus what what Kansas City, I think, would have done, which is we're going to take this game sudden death no matter what. We're going to know what we need. If we just need a field goal, great. If we need a touchdown, okay. If we need a touchdown because they got a touchdown, we're going to go for two and there is no going to be no third possession no matter what. That's the route I would go. 
I would do that second, but there's a lot of risk there. That is a high risk proposition. And to be able to say like, we're going to go out there. We're going to trust our defense. We're going to see what we can do on offense. I understand it. What I don't understand is the first three possessions of the second half, not running Christian McCaffrey more. And I know Kansas City's defense is really good. I understand what Kyle was doing to an extent. He was trying to break a tendency of being run first. Their running game wasn't particularly effective. They had a couple of nice runs, but a lot of short gains, which was leaving them on average like third and 12. It was nuts. Like their first six or seven third downs of the game, the literal average third down length was third and 12. Kansas City's defense was playing out of its mind. So you try to hit some passes on first and second down. You try to hit some play actions and give Brock Purdy some easier looks to throw into as opposed to these exotic Steve Spagnola third and long blitzes, which did have a really nice effect in the game. I understand it. I think he overdid it. It's not coaching malpractice. It is a mistake. I think that this isn't like Kyle choking or coming up short. Or I don't think the magnitude of the mistake is as big as maybe his game plan versus the Patriots in the 28-3 game. But it's definitely not ideal. But I also would remind people the biggest reason why the San Francisco 49ers are in the Super Bowl and are competitive and are in overtime is Kyle Shanahan. That, he to me, is the best coach in the league. That didn't change yesterday, even if I didn't love everything that he did. And maybe some of the things where he can still get better did come up. But week in, week out, design, implementation, everything, I still think he's the best coach in the league. That probably pisses some people off. I don't know what to tell you. It's my, it's my opinion. Number six. The biggest mistake the San Francisco 49ers have made in an organization, though, is they drafted a kicker in the fourth round. Jake Moody's the difference in the game, and I hate to put it, like, one of the differences. There, now I haven't put it all on this kid. Who's out there trying his best? It's not his fault they drafted him in the fourth round. But Jesus, man, you draft a kicker in the fourth round, he better be nails. That dude better be Sebastian Janikowski. That dude, and who I realized was a first-rounder, but, like, that dude better be Adam Vinatieri. That dude better be... Harrison Butker in 2023, the kicker on the other side. Instead, Moody's been upside down, you know, all year, hasn't been consistent, hasn't been reliable, and he, on his own, gets an extra point blocked with an, an a low line drive that he pulls. I think what you see on the 57 yarder from Butker is a low line drive through the middle, so that ball gets out clean over the snapper, because because that's not where the the dudes are. I mean, Moody. Pushes it right into the the hands of the blockers, right into a sea of hands, low on unnecessarily on a line drive, and think of how much how different that fourth quarter is if that kick is made because now the strategy changed, going forward on fourth down versus not, you know, field goal versus needing a touchdown, and and how San Francisco plays it with a lead versus not. There's so much that changes on that extra point, and I know there's other stuff in the game, but that is such a big play and the fact that it happens on a guy who's so tremendously overdrafted to me is like the just a ridiculous failure by an otherwise a brilliant and excellent and even model San Francisco franchise and there is incredible irony perhaps it's not even irony per- perhaps it is direct cause and effect that that one unbelievably silly decision comes back and bites them in their biggest game. Number seven. All right, quickly flowing through the rest, which we'll get back to some of this stuff later. Just time is running short. Steve Spagnola might be the best big game defensive coordinator ever. What he did with the Giants back in the day, beating Brady, uh, what he's done with Kansas City. um, He's got more rings now as a coordinator than anyone else in the history of the league, which makes sense because kind of the, the trajectory of his career. We talked about it with Graziano last week on Radio Row, that because he's in his 60s now, he's probably not getting another head coaching chance. He's just kind of stuck as a coordinator, um, but he's clearly a tremendous, tremendous defensive coordinator where a lot of other guys that have won multiple rings as coordinators ultimately get head coaching jobs. I mean, he his game plan was exceptional. His blitz package was incredible. And the the level that those guys play at, the the how well they are taught is just sensational. Which leads us to number eight. Something I mentioned earlier. 
the first and second down dominance is why San Francisco's three of whatever they were, 12, I think, on third down. Everyone wants to make it about the third down stat. Look at first and second down. The best way to be good on third down is to either avoid it altogether by getting a first down on first and second down or leave yourself third and short. And San Francisco was in a ton of third and longs, a ton of can't win situations. And then Spagnola dials up really good blitzes. And again, the level of detail, just one example, it was that McDuffie blitz where he comes inside. How often do we see that corner come around the outside and not get home? No, instead, they send the edge wide and loop McDuffie around inside, and he's got a direct shorter line to the quarterback. Those details are what make great blitzes, and they were on it yesterday for San Francisco, or for Kansas City and Spags. Number nine. Uh, number nine, speaking of McDuffie, speaking of Legereus Sneed, that is the best cornerback duo in the league and that wasn't the case going into the year the job that that staff has done i forgot their db's coach's name i'm sorry but he deserves credit so everyone go google his name and then give him a round of applause what they've done some high picks but some lower picks as well draft identify draft by identifying the right traits for your system and scheme develop those things what you want give guys clear instruction teach up the technique They've done everything right. What a job by those two DBs who were sensational yesterday and hats off to their coaches for putting them in that position. And then last but not least, a thought that we will chase for the rest of the week. Number 10. Mahomes is one of one. You get one per generation. Brady was the last generation. Mahomes is this guy's generation. And maybe you're lucky enough if you are a Joe Burrow or a Lamar Jackson or a Josh Allen or, you know, pick a quarterback who's actually beaten him in a Super Bowl. Like, maybe you get lucky enough to get one within it. Or if you're Peyton Manning and Brady's generation, you get you get a couple, right? But I think the question you have to ask if you're a team like Washington with the number two pick is, is Mahomes worth chasing? Is it worth just throwing it to the wall and saying, let's see if we can get the next one, knowing there's only one? Knowing that even if you get Joe Burrow, he's not Mahomes. Even if you get Lamar Jackson, he's not Mahomes. I think you have to try, but I also, there's part of me that wonders, is, is chasing what San Francisco's doing actually a, a better plan? Now, it hasn't paid off in Super Bowls yet, but it, do you give yourself a better chance? Or, and maybe it's a chance at high profile losses, but damn, like it is, it is a pretty fascinating roster building discussion. And I know the day after the Super Bowl where Mahomes is Mahomes, you know, MVP again, it seems so obvious, but I, I, I just, I open with Mahomes. I close with Mahomes to, to say this, he's the only one. He is one of one. And maybe Caleb Williams is that guy. Maybe Jaden Daniels is that guy. Maybe Drake May is that guy. And if so, you get the next one. Well, shoot. Now you're set. But, but, damn, that's hard to find. And it feels like building up a bunch of other positions might be a little bit easier. And you hope that you catch you catch Mahomes in a in-between cycle where they have to build up the roster post-Kelsey, etc. But we'll see what the next decade of NFL football holds. That's three for Patty Mahomes. That's first and 10 for us. When we get back, uh, a couple of other thoughts on the game. And then Eric Flack joins us to close out the hour. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and always live on the free Odyssey app. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.